When tragedy strikes, we are taught from a young age to call 911 or to call the local police and that they will help us out of trouble or help us to solve a crime if one has been committed. However, as I covered on this podcast many times now, unfortunately that is not always the way and that is not always the answer. We have covered multiple cases here on GBNF already that show that there are certainly times where the police decide that the easiest answer must be the right answer, and then what happens turns out to be the opposite of what we expect when authorities step in that are put in place to serve and protect. This week, we are covering what I do believe is one of those cases. Imagine the heartbreak of having your 15-year-old girl go missing, be found murdered, and then watching as an arrest is made only to have the entire case thrown out for lack of evidence. Now, imagine what it would be like to have seemingly no additional answers 37 years later. Was the killer that smart, or were the investigators that inept? Hello. My name is Lance, and welcome to episode 71 of Gone But Never Forgotten, Complete and Utter Failure to Investigate, The Carrie Ann Brown Story. Carrie Ann Brown was born in Burks Falls, Ontario, which is located approximately 250 kilometers north of Toronto and 90 kilometers south of North Bay, Ontario. Her parents were Jim Brown and Ann Brown, and she was born on August 19th of 1971. She had one brother, who was one year older than her, named Trevor, and one half-brother, who was four years older than she was, named Ian. When Carrie Ann was just three years old, the family would move from Burks Falls to Thompson on Manitoba. We covered Thompson in episode 39 of the podcast when we covered the unsolved murder of Melissa Chaboyer, the taxi driver who was murdered in a mall parking lot on November 26th of 2005. Thompson was a small mining town in northern Manitoba. Jim began to work at the Inco Nickel Mine, and Anne started to work at the hospital as a medical transcriptionist. In Thompson, Carrie was a popular girl, and she was attending R.D. Parker Collegiate, and had just started the 10th grade. The family lived on Trout Avenue. One of the things that people remember about Carrie is that she had an absolute disdain for bullies. She was known to stand up to bullies and to stand up for her friends, even though she herself was a slight, petite girl. When she went missing, she was approximately 5 feet tall and weighed approximately 80 pounds. On Thursday, October 16th of 1986, Carrie went to a party at a home of one of her friends from high school. The party was being held on a Thursday night because high school had a day off on the following day. While they were at the party and having a good time, the night took a twist for Carrie Ann when an ex-boyfriend showed up to the party with another girl. As anyone can imagine, that put a damper on the evening for Carrie Ann, and she talked to Nicole, her best friend, and told her that she wanted to leave the party. The plan was for the two girls to go back to Nicole's house for a sleepover. Eventually, the two girls would leave the house together. But before they got to the street, Nicole told Carrie Ann that she had forgotten her purse inside and that she needed to go back inside to retrieve it. Carrie Ann, likely not wanting to see her ex-boyfriend again, stayed to wait outside for Nicole. 
when Nicole returned with her purse after having an argument with her ex-boyfriend in the house in what would assume would only have been a few short minutes. Carrie Ann was gone. Nicole remembers coming out of the house and seeing Carrie Ann's boot prints in the lightly falling snow, and they just stopped. The boot prints led to nowhere. Sadly, that was all that there was to go on. There was no concrete eyewitness accounts to come in. There was nothing in real time to give anyone any idea of where to start, what had happened, who had scooped up Carrie Ann, or any additional evidence. With the benefit of hindsight and putting the story together, we are able to talk about this next part. Approximately two hours after Carrie Ann had disappeared, at 2 a.m., a phone call came in to the RCMP dispatch and Operator Marnie Schaefer would take the call. The person on the other end of the line would be in a panic. Schaefer remembers the call as if it happened yesterday. The man on the other end of the line told her that he had just killed someone and she remembers that he was also terrified when he was told that the entire call was being recorded. Things, in my opinion, get a little bit strange here with a couple of pieces of information. First, Nicole seemingly went home, got into an argument with her parents, and went to bed. For me personally, I don't know how you can go home and just go to sleep, even if you are drunk, if you're even slightly worried that your best friend may have been taken. There have been plenty of thoughts about this over the years, one of which has been that possibly Nicole just believed that Carrie Ann had received a ride home from someone else because she was upset, and another one is that one or both had been drinking and that would leave some room for interpretation about who was thinking what. Either way, no calls were made that night, seemingly to the family or to the police to report Carrie Ann as missing. The second thing that is puzzling is that Carrie Ann's dad did not call her in as missing until 4 p.m. on Friday, approximately 16 hours after she went missing outside of her friend's home. Of course, this can be chalked up to lots of different things. Perhaps the family was not aware Perhaps they were leaving time for Carrie Ann to turn up. It is very easy for us to judge, and I've seen a lot of people do so in other cases like this and in this case. But I don't think that it's entirely unheard of. The problem that this poses, though, is of course that whoever did take Carrie Ann had a long head start to cover their tracks. Unfortunately, the family and investigators did not have long to wait to find out what happened. On Saturday, around 2 p.m., which was 38 hours after she went missing, a grisly discovery would be made. Two horseback riders found a naked body along a hydro line that was close to a horse stable and a golf access road on the outskirts of town. Investigators would determine that Carrie Ann had been sexually assaulted, and severely beaten with branches that were likely found at the scene. At the young age of 15, a vibrant and innocent life had been taken. Nearby the body, there was evidence that a vehicle had gotten stuck, and then whomever was there had used a floor mat and an air mattress to try and get traction to get the vehicle out from where it was left. Eyewitnesses would report to police that they had seen both a white van and an older 1970s muscle car near the scene where Carrie Ann's body was found. It was reported that the RCMP did find DNA samples from at least two men at the scene, which led to them believing that there was more than one person involved in the assault and murder. But unfortunately, there was never a match made to anyone. There were different reports, too, that would come in to investigators, including reports that Carrie Ann was seen getting into a van, and reports that Carrie Ann had gotten into a taxi. Unfortunately, almost all of the evidence was exactly that. Circumstantial, word of mouth, guesses, and you guessed it, not anything that was concrete. More of that was to come in this case, sadly. 
Only one set of charges were ever laid in this case, and to this day, the charges and the person are still the topic of much debate. The person that was arrested was Patrick Sumner. Patrick had a vehicle that matched the 1970s muscle car that was reported as having been seen near where Carrie Ann's body was found around the time that she had gone missing. As such, the RCMP zeroed in on that car and Patrick. Within a week, Patrick had been charged with first-degree murder. Get ready for what amounted to a whole bunch of circumstantial evidence. And, as I will delve into more later, I think that this amounted to lazy police work. Investigators would announce that they pulled hairs from Patrick's car that were consistent with Carrie's hair. And at this preliminary hearing, it would be reported that investigators said that there was a stain found in his car as well that they believed was consistent with blood. When further analysis was done, though, it was deemed that the hair could not be proven to have been Carrie Ann's hair. And the stain? It was tomato-based juice. It was a spill. Unreal. That's all that I can say. I understand that this was the 1980s, but to make such two such errors in judgment over evidence and to press charges based on those, it blows my mind. To mistake probably something like V8 juice for blood and just assume that a brown hair belonged to the victim is truly asinine in my opinion. I did forget to mention though, another piece of evidence that resulted in Patrick's arrest was the fact that more than one person reported to police that Patrick was washing his car the day after Carrie disappeared. Yep. RCMP would also seize a shirt from Patrick's home that contained blood that the officers said matched the blood type that Carrie had. Patrick would later say that the shirt was far too big for him and that it had belonged to his father. He also said that the blood on the shirt was from pimples on his father's back. Forensic tests did later prove that the blood belonged to his father. The preliminary hearing for Patrick Sumner would be held from February 17th to 20th of 1987. Provincial Judge Charles Newcomb would dismiss the first-degree murder charge against Patrick, who had been in custody since October 23rd of the previous year. All of the evidence that was held against Patrick was believed to have been circumstantial, and it was believed that the Crown had failed to establish any direct connection between Patrick Sumner and the homicide of Carrie Ann. One cannot help but to agree with this. Whether Patrick was involved in any way in the death and assault of Carrie Ann or not, you cannot just send someone to jail because they're the easy option and because some people say that they saw his car or him washing his car. For what it's worth, to this day, Patrick Sumner still lives in Thompson and maintains that he had absolutely nothing to do with Carrie's murder. He did, however, spend four months, 16 days, and 23 hours behind bars. He, however, has also essentially served a life sentence as a pariah. To this day, he struggles to find work and faces a lot of backlash because many in the community believe that he is guilty. He also says that he suffers from PTSD because of the images that he was shown of Carrie's bludgeoned body during that preliminary hearing. And you can't blame him here. It's definitely interesting. You might think, like, why wouldn't he leave? But you're kind of damned if you do and you're damned if you don't if you're Patrick here. Um, if you stay... You're going to have a hard life. People are going to look at you sideways. There's going to be a lot of people in Thompson that think that Patrick was the murderer. But if you move away, it's the same thing. People will start talking and say that you ran away. So it's hard to say what the right thing to do is in this situation. And obviously I'm not saying Patrick's innocent. It's possible that he was involved. But all these years later you would think... Hopefully something would come out to connect him to the case if there was evidence. One thing that has seemingly come out in this case as well is the fact that apparently the aforementioned 911 call that came in 
was likely never investigated by the RCMP in this case, which is bizarre. In fact, some of the key investigators have said that they were never made aware of such a call, and some of them simply say that the call was not ever made. Make of that what you will. Personally, that sounds like a cover-your-ass type of response. As Schaefer came out about the call that, they had, that, they, that she had taken, it sounds to me like the RCMP had to say something about the call, and since they seemingly already had their best suspect put forward, it looks to my eyes like they never looked further into this call of someone saying that they had killed someone. For what it's worth, according to archives, there were no other murders recorded in Thompson nor the surrounding areas around the same time that Carrie Ann was assaulted and killed. Marnie says that she has never heard of someone calling in to say that they had killed someone in her 22 years of working for the RCMP. And she also says that she was never interviewed about the call that she had taken. Marnie has said that the man that called in never gave a name and never gave any details about a victim, but she did say that she believed that he had a northern indigenous accent. He also insisted that he speak to a specific RCMP officer who was stationed at the Norway House Cree Nation Detachment, which is an indigenous community that's located approximately 200 kilometers south of Thompson. Marnie Schaefer says that she believed that the man on the phone knew the officer that he was asking for and that she did play the recording for the officer in question, but he had said that he was unable to identify the voice on the recording. She also says that she tagged John Toast, who was one of the lead investigators in the case, and that he had said that there, he was not all that interested in the call and that he believed that they already had the perpetrator, obviously referring to Patrick, who was neither indigenous nor was he from Cree Nation. She also says that she set the tape aside. It sat there for about a month and then it disappeared. There are no known copies of the tape of the recording of that call. Investigators today say that the tape was looked into, while, T while Toast said that he was never made aware of the tape. The officer that was mentioned in the call has never been publicly named. To this day, Patrick has not been cleared in this case as a person of interest, and investigators repeat that he was not found not guilty. Instead, the charges were thrown out before the case went to trial. Sadly, now, all these years later, all that is left is a family and friends that remember the incredible young woman that Carrie Ann Brown was and the hope that somebody will come forward with information or with a confession. Carrie's mom sadly passed away from cancer 15 years after Carrie Ann was murdered and her father is not doing well today either. Her brother Trevor believes that Jim is holding on in hopes that he can either see charges laid or at least receive an answer as to what happened to his daughter almost 37 years ago. I, of course, come alongside the family with these wishes and hope that if you know anything that you will come forward and make what you know be known by investigators in what is called Manitoba's largest cold case. There is certainly someone or some people out there that know what happened in this case and who is responsible. For me, I believe that it's more than one person or that it has to be someone that was known and trusted on some level by Carrie Ann. She either willingly went into a vehicle with someone that was known to her because she was flustered and irritated that her friend was taking too long, or this was more than one person, because I don't see how one person could have kidnapped her in front of a house full of young people and a neighborhood surrounding without someone hearing or seeing something. If this was a stranger, they would have needed to park the car, get out of the car, force Carrie Ann into the car, 
secure her in some way inside of the car, and then get back and drive away. All in the time that Nicole was in the house in an argument with her ex-boyfriend and getting her purse. I just don't see how this one could be pulled off by one person if they didn't know Carrie. In a small town like Thompson with a lot of crime, as we covered in Melissa Chaboyer's case, this is another awful crime and senseless loss of life like they had sadly seen before and would see again after. I do feel like I need to say that I blame inept police work in this case as well. It appears that the investigators, as we have seen in previous cases, took the path of least resistance and easiest answers and essentially moved on from this case. I am disgusted at what is publicly available in this case. I feel for the family, and of course I feel for the poor girl who's at the center of it all. She is gone, and someone has possibly found a way to live with this on their conscience now for nearly 40 years. If you are out there and know anything, again, please come forward with what you know and give everyone involved some peace of mind after they lost a young 15-year-old girl. If you would like a comprehensive look into this case and the people around it, I suggest that you listen to Season 5 of Someone Knows Something. That is an incredible CBC podcast that lays everything out for you, including fact, fiction, and opinion. And it gives you a deep look into what it's like to live in a world where your daughter, sister, and friend was assaulted and killed, and there are still no answers. In closing, please follow us on social media and sign up to be a part of our supporters over on Patreon if you do like the show so that you can be made aware of any updates in this case and hopefully we can all share the details when the truth finally comes to light. We appreciate each and every one of you goners out there that support the show on a day-to-day and week-to-week basis. Don't forget to come back next week as we delve into another true crime case together. It's something that's going on presently in the news, um, not the case itself, but there it is back in court. That's the spoiler that I'm going to give you. Um, so definitely check back next week. Have a wonderful week and don't forget to be better. Thank you for listening.